Hello and welcome. You're listening to the Town Sounds Oral History Podcast, celebrating the musical heritage of Kirklees. I'm Sam Hodgson. This episode is entitled From the Hilltops, Musical Festivals in Kirklees. This podcast is brought to you by Let's Go Yorkshire, Kirklees Year of Music 2023, Kirklees Council and Sam H. Song. Just before we start, I'll say that in the description of this episode, you should be able to find all the show notes, scripts, links, and names that are mentioned throughout. So if you want any more information, just check out the description. Today we'll learn about some of the most prestigious festivals happening around Kirklees, and to do so, I'll speak to some people. Anne Tallboy is the administrator of Huddersfield Mrs Sunderland Festival. Alex Bywater is one of the organisers of Homeforth Festival of Folk. Barney Stevenson, the ex-artistic director of Marsden Jazz Festival, David Minnick, the director of Cleckheaton Folk Festival, Mary Agnes Krell, the founder and organiser of the Grand Northern Ukulele Festival, and Mark Bakovietz, the technician at Huddersfield Contemporary Music Festival for about 23 years. We'll also hear from Julie Bakovietz and Ruby Wood. In this podcast, I'll be finding out about some of the challenges of festival organisation. We'll get to know of the difficulties the organisers have gone through to keep the festival going all these years, and the changes that have been made recently to keep them modern, fresh and exciting. We'll also hear firsthand of some of the highlights, some of the big names, and some of the amazing things that have happened in Kirklees because of these music festivals. Let's hear first from Mark Bakovietz. One of the most ambitious and memorable festival performances was of a piece called Le Noir Le Toile, composed by Gérard Grisset. The performance took place in a large sports hall. The piece was composed for six percussionists. Literally, thousands of tons of sand were brought in to completely cover the floor in an attempt to dampen down the acoustic sound from the percussionists and to reduce reverberation. It was experiences like this that have provided so many happy memories and unique experiences for the 23 years I was involved in the Contemporary Music Festival. More like that later in the podcast. But before we get into Huddersfield's Contemporary Festival, I'm going to go back in time to the oldest of the festivals. So first of all, cast your imaginations back to 1888, which was the start of the Huddersfield Mrs Sunderland Festival. But who was Mrs Sunderland? And Tallboys to tell us more. We were aware that there was a perception that it was something to do with Sunderland. And of course it isn't, because Mrs Sunderland, who the festival is named after, was um, a Victorian singer who was very much favoured by Queen Victoria. So Queen Victoria went to her concerts and asked for her to perform in London, etc., etc. The music we're listening to is the Slawit Philharmonic Orchestra, founded in 1891, performing Rachmaninoff's Second Symphony. Sorry about the clipping in the audio quality there. So, staying in the 1890s then, Susan Sunderland was a soprano singer known poetically as the Calderdale Nightingale. She was born in Brighouse, now the very borderline between Calderdale and Kirklees and it was Brighouse that supported her to gain the recognition she deserved. Brighouse Parish Church, to be specific. They recognised her exceptional singing first, when she was only 12 years old, and three years later she began what was to be a 45-year career performing all over the country. Her final farewell concert was, you guessed it, in Huddersfield, at the Philosophical Hall on June 3rd, 1888. As part of her lasting legacy, a competition was held under her name, and the winners received prizes from the lady herself. The Mrs Sunderland competition, as it was called, began just for female solo singers. It took place, in the first instance, in Huddersfield in 1889. I tamed your insignificant progenitor. That was an extract of audio taken from the 1989 documentary A Centenary for Mrs Sunderland, produced by the Huddersfield Video and Sign Club. The singer was Barbara Brooke of Goka. 
To start with then, the Mrs Sunderland, as the competition was known locally, was small, local and exclusive. But it's not like that anymore. In 2023, the year of this podcast's release, the Huddersfield Mrs Sunderland Festival will run over the course of most of February. It includes music, drama and speech workshops, classes and performances, traditional competitions and modern ones as well. And it's huge. We used to run something called the Kirklees Young Musician of the Year. One of our sponsors sponsors us for a prize of a thousand pounds for this. So it's quite a prestigious competition. And two years ago, we decided that we weren't going to make it just Kirklees anymore. We would make it national. And this year we have been heavily oversubscribed. It is a festival which this year will be in its 133rd year. And in that 133 years, it has only missed twice. Once during the Second World War and last year, which was the COVID. It's one of the biggest festivals in the country. Normally, in the last few years, we've had about 4,000 people who perform over 10 days. The bedrock of the festival is about 120 different classes for vocals, instrumentals, piano, speech, drama and choirs. This year we're doing Foray's Requiem and we've got 120 people signed up for that. So they will spend the day learning Foray's Requiem if they don't know it already. And then there's a concert in the evening and and we perform it. So we have a special needs workshop and all the special schools in Kirklees and Calderdale come and perform for us. We have a full day where we we take the key stage two children from the whole of Kirtley's. This year we've got 32 junior schools represented. They do some work beforehand of what we're going to be singing and then they all come together and it fills the town hall. It's absolutely brilliant. Those interview segments were from a conversation I had with Anne in 2022. She described the festival as a mammoth undertaking. And it sounds pretty mammoth to me. The dark winter evening streets. A constant tumbling cloud overhead. Perhaps snow. But more likely cold Pennine rain. It's cold all right. It's February. There is soot on the sandstone walls and towering retired chimneys veiling the silver of the moon. And meanwhile, out of this post-industrial landscape, 4,000 musicians follow the warm golden glow escaping from the peaking windows of the town hall. Nervous, probably, right? Wouldn't you be? Singers, players, dancers, poets, they're all there, full of anticipation, worry and excitement. This festival involves an enormous amount of work and organisation. Expectations are high and the festival runs like a well-oiled machine. The challenges, the massive effort involved, the rehearsals, the planning, the accounts, the decisions to be made, the liaising, the management, most of it goes completely unnoticed. Most of the festival happens behind the curtain. In fact, you could say that most of the festival happens when the festival isn't actually taking place. But it's not just the Mrs Sunderland Festival, though. This mammoth undertaking is felt by many event organisers. It is one of the connecting points between the festivals in this podcast. Local festivals are often the wild dreams of just a few people. People who often work tirelessly for little or no money to ensure that those dreams come true. Festival organisation is a job for the strong-willed, like David Minnick of the Cleckheaton Folk Festival. I met him over a pint at the West Riding in Dewsbury. There are always hiccups. There are always hiccups in life, so there shouldn't be any different with a folk festival. Um, But we just get on with them, sort them out and carry on. The big thing about hiccups is not letting the people that are paying to come know that they exist. Audiences perhaps don't really realise what a fine balance these festivals survive on, both in terms of people and in terms of money, as Alex Bywaters from the Home Firth Festival of Folk explains here. I don't know whether the balance is right. We're still carrying on. We've still got money in the bank for next year. I suppose you could say that it is all right. The, the caveat is getting people to organise it. Currently, 
my wife, myself, person who was on the original committee going back along, she must be 70 and a bit. You know, it's like we, we are an old organisation and we need to get youngsters in. And, and that, that's, that's the biggest fear. Home Firth Festival of Folk, along with quite a lot of other festivals, relies somewhat on funding from grants, such as the National Lottery Community Project Grant. Grants like this are very difficult and time-consuming to apply for. They're often extremely competitive, and it's pretty uncertain whether the festival will get the funding or not. Cleckheaton Folk Festival mitigates against some of these risks by getting several smaller pots of funding from different contributors. We did some crowdfunding for the 2020 festival, but we still get terrific support from the local businesses in Cleckheaton. The support from Kirklees Council has been tremendous, and without it, we probably couldn't go. Marsden Jazz Festival also received a flurry of grants through the early 2000s. Marsden Jazz takes place over a rainy weekend in October. And when I spoke to Barney Stevenson on March the 15th, 2022, he was applying for funding for that same year. It takes the team the whole year to get the festival organised and booked, as Barney explains here. Because we're in the thick of running and, and producing a festival over the summer, that makes it very, very difficult to find the capacity to um, plan and build good funding bids um, for the following year. So, yes, we are on a kind of, you know, you kind of deliver a festival, breathe a sigh of relief, and then it's straight on to pushing the stone up the slope again to get the next one planned and funded. We have to have planned and booked artists before we apply for the money because we have to talk about the artists and the plans in the application. It's, I, I, when I started... I had a head of hair and it was black and now it's grey and I've and there's very barely anything left on the top. So, uh, you know, <laughs> that's, that's the impact it has. I asked Barney what would happen if they didn't receive a grant one year, to which he said... It, I wish it wasn't so, but it would cause a, a serious crisis. This is the bit that I, I think a lot of people don't fully grasp is that we do run the risk of being turned down for funding each year so each year it feels like we have to make double the effort of the previous year to make sure that we make a case for the um, work to be supported again that is the most stressful part of the festival the year that that interview took place the festival did not receive the grant it was still a success but immediately after the festival barney stepped down as festival director the toil of such a challenging job can dishearten even the strongest of wills. Like Mrs Sunderland Festival, Marsden Jazz is a torrential storm of organisation, planning, curation and making sure everything is timed perfectly. The Jazz Festival started in 1991. The impetus behind the festival was the refurbishment of Marsden Mechanics Hall, the ideal venue for a new festival. Barney Stevenson, who we've just heard from, didn't get fully involved until 2006. He was then the artistic director until 2022. In part, thanks to Barney, the festival has been host to some world-class jazz. This is perhaps an odd contrast with the rural moorland village of less than 4,000 residents, where usually the only musical parades are the free-roaming, bleating sheep strutting through the quiet streets to an unsuspecting garden, But in fact, Marsden is not really a sleepy village at all. It's known for its quirkiness in the area, a druid fire festival every other February, a uniquely creative display of Christmas lights that really has to be seen to be understood, and some of the finest local businesses in the area. Marsden goes above and beyond its mill town history and beautiful landscape, and the jazz festival is no different. One of the strengths of Marsden Jazz, especially since Barney has been there, has been the hosting of progressive, cutting-edge jazz from around the world. Like you would expect from this village, it's not just tradition, it's oddity. Thank <laughs> you. 
The music we're hearing is Gion 5 to 8, recorded in the moors over the Stanage Tunnel. Marsden born Tom Challenger improvises on the saxophone into a remote pump house near Redbrook Reservoir. It was recorded by Jez Riley French. Barney embraced the weird and wonderful, the out there, the free jazz, the rare, unusual, beautiful, during his time curating Marsden Jazz. But it wasn't just the music he was looking to diversify. Here's Barney again. For example, we're, we've signed up uh, over the past few years to an initiative called Key Change, which looks at gender representation um, on stage and programming in, uh, in festivals, and also with an organisation called Black Lives in Music, which looks at um, race representation, made clear that we are, it's more about than just the music. This, you know, we, we, we create different relationships. The, the, our charitable purposes are as an education um, organisation. So we're educating people in jazz and related forms of music, and we're encouraging diversity. Those are kind of burnt in, hard-coded into the constitution, which enables us to exist as an organisation. So they're absolutely there. Jazz is an art form of black origin. Uh, you know, there are quite a lot of white guys involved in jazz. Um, and it kind of, once you get involved and start thinking about it, you can't help but kind of have to explore your own attitudes to it. We wear our values on our sleeve. Um, and, you know, some people may think we're being kind of deliberately provocative or politically provocative, but no, it's, 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 it's a kind of, to me, I hope there's a sort of honesty about how we go about running the festival and what um, and what are the kind of underpinning thoughts and ideas and values that, that, that explain why we do what we do. Some of these thoughts were echoed by Mary Agnes Krell of the Grand Northern Ukulele Festival when I spoke to her. And from the beginning, our festival was about openness and friendliness, like everybody's welcome. And, and you don't even have to play the ukulele, we'll teach you. And you can hate the ukulele, and we'll have some events that don't even have to do with the ukulele, so you can still have a good time. Every year, somebody that you don't even know comes up to you at the end of the festival, smiling in tears of joy to say thanks because they met a new friend, or they learned a new thing, or they just felt less lonely. Putting on events that are open to everybody, where everybody's welcome, is landing really well. And Alex Bywaters from the Home Fair Festival of Folk. I'd like to have more than 50% women, female, on the festival bill. Because wherever, wherever you go to a festival, it's all dominated by males. The, the last few years when I've been able to, I've, I've just tried to tip that balance towards the female side of it. I've not shouted about it. I've not put it on any, you know, any, but it's been a conscious, or it's been a conscious policy for me who books most of the bands. Mary Agnes Krell knows of some of the discriminations inherent in the music and arts industry firsthand. I asked her whether she'd ever experienced any gender discrimination hosting events in the UK. She started out by laughing at the question. <laughs> so much so. So I'm a member of the Association of Festival Organisers. And when you go along to the Association of Festival Organisers conferences, there it's like all men. It's like a dude's show. And, um, but luckily, the, it, it, despite the gender imbalance in the room, the people there themselves are quite turned on to the fact that like anybody can produce a festival. And so they share information really freely and I find that really positive. But I put on events and I am able to see them through from start to finish. I have had a lot of people ask to work with me. As a person, I have had to learn when some dude is coming along and just asking me to do all the work so they can take the credit. And I've experienced that a few times. And um, I would say that as I've gotten older, I've gotten better at recognizing it quite early on and not engaging with the project. So yeah, I do see it. I see that immediate dismissal sometimes that you get when you walk into a room wearing a bra and other people who don't require one just don't give you as much time or attention as you think you deserve. And I've seen that thing um, where people do recognize that you've got formidable skill or talent and they just want you to do the work for them and so they can claim the glory and I try to steer around those you kind of know you're born a woman and you go into music and the arts and you're going to deal with the gender-based struggles but I'm not young anymore I recently turned 50 and I f and and in the pandemic I stopped coloring my hair so it's gone a bit gray I'm actually invisible I have walked into like open mics and gigs where people used to 
say hello and recognize me. Like open mics, I walk in with an instrument. They used to ask if I wanted to play something. They don't anymore. So I used to deal with and face that challenge of gender. And I'm increasingly dealing with and facing that challenge of aging. And the, the aging one is interesting for me because I don't want to face it in the most obvious way. I don't want to just like try to look younger, color my hair and get fillers or something. And at the same time, I don't want to assert my authority in a way that shuts down the voices of younger people. So that challenge of aging is an even bigger challenge for me than the challenge of gender. That music playing in the background is a traditional ukulele tune, Guava Jam, performed there by Sarah Maisel and Craig Chi. Mary organises the Grand Northern Ukulele Festival. The festival is multi-award winning. And to give you an idea of what to expect from GNUF, as audiences fondly call it, in 2019, the festival hosted 45 live performances, as well as workshops and an open mic. It crossed over nine stages throughout Huddersfield over a jam-packed weekend. For those few days, the festival doesn't seem to ever stop. When everyone else has gone to bed, the ukulele audiences and musicians stay up at their chosen hotels and late-night bars, playing ukulele until the morning comes again. A burning flame of passion for the ukulele. Every year, the town of Huddersfield is ignited with a global community of people who absolutely love music. People travel from everywhere to get to this festival and when they all get together it is an unstoppable force the town is filled with people carrying tiny string instruments on their backs it's like traveling to an alternative universe for the weekend (laughs) an amazing instrument which has the power to connect musicians of all abilities let's listen to some more this is Staying Home Tonight by Phil Dolman. Don't want to go out to a bar or see a West End show. I've got everything I need with my TV and radio. A similarly initialed festival with close values to Gnuff, but a very different musical form is the Huddersfield Contemporary Music Festival, or HCMF. Hookamuff. <laughs> Hookamuff is now the UK's largest international festival of new and experimental music. The festival includes exhibitions, installations, live concerts, short taster gigs, interactive music for toddlers and babies, tours of the musical archives, films, well-being based singing workshops and all sorts of other things that I just don't know how to name. Part of the role of HCMF is to demystify contemporary and experimental music. Some of the general public sees this kind of music as a bit distant and strange and maybe elitist at times, so the festival puts in extra effort to break down those barriers. Like the ukulele festival, the aim is to make music accessible to everyone. They have a whole day of free music and workshops which aim to get everyone involved. Everyone is welcome. Nowadays, HCMF feels like an unbreakable fabric, inextricably linked to Huddersfield, as if it's always been there and always will be. But like Marsden Jazz and Home Fair Festival of Folk, HCMF too had an uncertain and humble beginning. To find out more, I spoke to Mark Bakoviets, who was there right from the start in the late 1970s. So I, was, I came, I started working in 1979 for the university, uh, and that was the second year of the contemporary music festival so it was really small i mean the the, um, the brochures were were tiny you know half the size of an a4 sheet and uh, sort of stapled together very so quite basic and the of course i came in set up the studio but we had no live gear in terms of processing getting the sound out there sound reinforcement so we had to buy some gear in and, and it was fairly basic stuff really back in the day so we had lots of gigs all over the, the town uh, there was Spen Street Art Centre which has gone just working with incredible people as well you know taking the gear literally walking across from the unit from the polytechnic in those days to, to an art centre plugging it all up for various artists also working in St Paul's Hall which was fairly new to it had only recently been sort of deconsecrated and put on on, on on the online for uh, for live works 
uh, and then the, the old recital hall as well. And then also we used um, Milton Hall. It was great. It was such an exciting time. Uh, I'd never met a classical musician, but then all of a sudden I'm meeting all these famous people. I won't do a lot of, I won't do a name drop, but a lot, lots of really famous people who are now no longer with us, you know. Yeah, I worked, I worked as sound manager there for, must have been 25 years until it got so big that we had to uh, employ um, external uh, firms and contractors to bring in um, state-of-the-art sound systems uh, to actually um, uh, support the level of uh, gigs we were doing at the festival. Mark works alongside his wife, Julie, in making extraordinary musical instruments, which we're going to discuss in another podcast. But she also has something to say about the beginnings of Huddersfield Contemporary Music Festival. Having Terry Riley come into the recording studio, because he's got a bit of a problem with his synth, you know, so it's like, is there anybody around that can fix it? And then watching Mark take a synth apart and fix it for him, you know, I mean, (laughs) it's fantastic. It used to happen a lot. Yeah, it did, it did. Yeah, it's all hands on and uh, get down with the soldering iron and sort things out. And the two have seen some very big gigs indeed. Think space size. Space as in stars and planets and stuff. The, the size of the gigs got bigger and bigger as the, as the festival got more money, got bigger. Uh, and so there were incredi- incredible uh, events. And Mark went to Jodrell Bank and worked with the team over there in order to beam in the sound of a pulsar in live into the space, so you were out to work at, with Jodrell and yeah. British Telecom. This was like almost pre-internet time, so things like getting a sound of a pulsar from Jodrell Bank in real time into the sports centre. Uh, we had, they had to put special what was called ISDN lines in. There was no ethernet connections like we've got now and Wi-Fi, uh, so all that had to be arranged just to hear some pop, pop, pop sounds from, you know, light years away. Mark was too modest to discuss some of the famous composers he's worked with over the years, but perhaps you'll know some of these names that have performed at HCMF. Stockhausen, Terry Riley, Brian Eno, Steve Reich, even John Cage. One of the great things about having festivals like these in the local area is that they bring in internationally famous musicians that would ordinarily be unlikely to come to a small place like Marsden, Homefirth or Huddersfield. But this is exactly what's been happening in Cleckheaton each year since 1988 for the Cleckheaton Folk Festival. In fact, it's hard to think of many big folk players that have not come to Cleckheaton in that time. Martin Carthy, The Albion Band, Bob Fox, Norma Waterson, Chris Parkinson, Eliza Carthy, The Youngins, Cara Dillon, Martin Simpson, Martha Tilston, The Demon Barbers, Lady Maisery, Sean Lakeman, Josie Ann Clark, The Rheingen Sisters, Bella Hardy, Pete Coe, the list goes on. But despite all these big names who take the festival's limelight, David Minich speaks most fondly of the festival's audience, of its community, of its friendships. Clecky Folk Festival is like many other folk festivals up and down the country. It's a town festival. Um, A lot of festivals are are field, greenfield festivals. Ours is a town festival. But it's a coming together of a family that meet each other, possibly only that once in a year. So we'll see people in Clefeaton that will never come to Clefeaton again till next year. And we'll greet friends every year that we'll not see again for another 12 months. And that's the nice thing about Clefeaton Folk Festival. David talks there about how important community is for Clefeaton Folk Festival. And music does bring us all together. And in fact, every person I spoke to for this podcast said the same thing. That at the heart of it all are the people. Every festival organiser I spoke to for this podcast mentioned a need for more people to get involved in the festivals. Not even audiences necessarily, there seems to be loads of that, but people to help, 
people to organise, people to curate, people to support their local festivals more so they can continue for as many years to come as they've already had. The people who live in Kirklees might take some of these festivals for granted. I know that I do. Every year I look forward to these festivals and every year I tell myself I must go to more stuff next year in the presumed knowledge that they will be happening next year at all. Wouldn't it be great if Cleckheaton Folk Festival, the Grand Northern Ukulele Festival and Marsden Jazz, like Mrs Sunderland, got to be 133 years old? Why? Because these festivals are vital to music, to friendships, to community. These are the events in which audience members fall in love, where festival founders realise their dreams, where organisers gain professional experience and where musicians cut their teeth. To prove it, this is Ruby Wood, the internationally renowned Huddersfield singer, best known for her role in Submotion Orchestra. Do you know what? I'm so grateful for Mars and Giles. Like... It's so encouraging that a festival like that that has, you know, really... They've got a really good reputation, haven't they? And they get a lot of amazing artists. You know, the fact that they then support younger musicians growing up in the scene. There's not like a glass ceiling. They've always really encouraged me and other people to to experiment, really. And, and I don't think they discriminate or they allow you to grow, which I've really appreciated. We've heard just how important these festivals are but also how difficult it is for them. That they are up against tight budgets, closing businesses, ageing committees, modernisation and sometimes discrimination. These podcasts are largely here to celebrate the Kirklees music scene. However, we should never take any of it for definite. Many wonderful Kirklees festivals have fallen by the wayside over the years. The ones we have continue to need our help. Here is David Minich and Alex Bywaters with the last words of the podcast, summarising how important community support is for local festivals. To be honest, I worry about the festival not from a financial viewpoint, but from a volunteer viewpoint, because the team that currently manages the festival, and I'm, I'm talking about the whole team then, becomes somewhere around 110, 115 people. The unfortunate thing is that 115 people since I took over as festival director, director in 2008 are now 15 years older. Uh, and the, the younger end of the festival organisation is probably in their mid-60s. That's the younger end. The older end are in the mid-80s. What we need is some young blood coming forward to run a festival. 78 it started, there is a demand for it from the community side, from, from getting young talent out there to get their first chance. You know, it's really nice to be able to find someone from the schools that's set up their own band and be able to offer them a spot at the festival so they can say, I've played Home for a Folk Festival. That's that's great, that's, that's what we're here for, you know, to bring that talent through. But in order to do that, you need the venues, you need the money, you need the the people to actually scout and utilise and say, Alex, have you seen this band or heard this band that are from the high school? That's the sort of thing that we, we need. So help me, Bob, I'm bully in the alley. Way, hey, bully in the alley. Help me, Bob, I'm bully in the alley. Bully down in Shinbo now. Now Sally's a girl in Shinmoan Alley. Way, hey, bully in the alley. Sally is a girl in Shinmoan Alley. Bully down in Shinmoan Alley. So help me, Bob, I'm bully in the alley. Way, hey, bully in the alley. Help me, Bob, I'm bully in the alley. Bully down in Shinmoan Alley. I found myself down on the key, oh way, hey, bully in the alley. Found myself with time so free, oh bully down in Shinmo now. That was a section of traditional sea shanty, Bully in the Alley, performed by local band Kimber's Men, who played at Cleckheaton Folk Festival in 2022. Well, thank you for listening to the first podcast in our 12-part series exploring a wide range of Kirklees music scenes. I hope you enjoyed it. The conversations heard in this podcast were recorded by me and Mandeep Samra over 2021 and 2022 for the Town Sounds Oral History Project. 
Full recordings of the conversations are available at the West Yorkshire Archive Service. The conversations recorded for the Oral History Project include those with people from a wide range of musical disciplines. For example, handbell ringing, rock and roll, reggae, steel pan, hip-hop, dubstep, jazz, and traditional musics from India, Pakistan, Ukraine, Ireland, Poland, Bosnia, England, Kurdistan, and Iran. You've been listening to the Town Sounds Oral History Podcast. This has been Episode 1, From the Hilltops, Musical Festivals in Kirklees. We'll be back with another episode in the near future, so keep your eyes peeled on social media. Follow Let's Go Yorkshire and SamH.Song on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. This was a Let's Go Yorkshire and Sam H. Song production. The host and producer was Sam Hudson. The podcast has been supported by Kirklees Council, Kirklees Year of Music 2023 and the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Town Sounds explores the musical histories of Kirklees to uncover untold stories through the voices of local people living musical lives. For more information on this podcast, please visit musicinkirklees.co.uk.